Hello everyone, my name is Brendan Snyder. Thank you so much for joining me and welcome to top 10 popular albums that I never need to hear again. So let me just start by saying, first of all, they're all classic albums I'm gonna be talking about here and that I do think that every one of these albums is one that people should have within their collection or at least it have owned at one time. I myself have loved all of these albums and played them relentlessly when I first heard them. However, they're generally considered to be the band's most popular albums, and therefore they get the most airplay out of all the other material that these bands release. And in that case, I just think that they're overplayed, making them all albums that I never need to hear again for those reasons. I've got 10 such albums that I want to run through with you, but before we get started, if you're new to my channel and you haven't already hit the subscribe button, please click the button. Also leave a comment, hit like, all those things help support my channel. And of course, if you turn on notifications, you're gonna stay up to date on really cool episodes just like this about top 10 popular albums that at least I never need to hear again and probably you too. All right, so let's jump right into this thing here. Coming in at number 10, and I'm sure all of these are gonna be shocks to people, but hey, it is what it is, right? Iron Maiden, <laughs> The Number of the Beast, 1982. Third studio album from them, it was the first to feature Bruce Dickinson. It was the last to feature their drummer Clive Burr on it. Surprisingly, at least for me, this thing has sold over 20 million copies worldwide. Not shocker in the sense that the album is that popular, just that I've never thought of Iron Maiden as a band that sells big amounts in albums. They're just a huge touring band in my mind. In the US, they, the album itself has only gone platinum, but worldwide, 20 million copies, and that's cool because I'm a huge Iron Maiden fan. And big tracks off of this album here, Run to the Hills, Number of the Beast, but it's just one of those albums. Again, those songs are played every time live, all the time on metal radio shows and stuff like that. In Countdowns, this is always everybody's number one album, stuff like that. And it's just one of those things that I hear so much about, you see so much of, stuff like that, that it becomes one of those albums that I tend to steer clear of for that reason. All right, moving on to number nine. We've got Smashing Pumpkins, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, 1995 third studio album. And right away you can see that first of all, I own all of these albums. And not only do I own all of them, in the cases of like this one and some other ones, I own box set editions. So I may be saying I don't need to hear any of these albums, but at the same time, as I said, I still love these albums. So. As I said, third studio album for this one, 28 track double album. That was a big deal in 1995 when that happened. Just not a lot of bands in the 80s and 90s releasing double albums. So this was a big deal. Debuted at number one when it was released. It has sold over 5 million copies, but is actually certified for 10 million in sales because it's a double album. So it actually counts twice. Uh, features uh, Bullet with Butterfly Wings on it, 1979, Tonight, Tonight, Zero, and 33. Those are the big hits off of this thing. And for me, I think at least it's the song 1979, maybe more than anything on here that was just so overplayed at the time. But again, it's that album that everybody associates with the band that is super popular. And a lot of this too just goes back to how much I played the thing at the time. It was the height of the band's career. Uh, I was playing this thing a lot. It's all over radio. It's all over MTV. Uh, the band is playing the thing, uh, so many of these tracks live in concert. And when you get to that level of uh, the stuff being overplayed and just seemingly everywhere. It's one of those albums that has no surprises left for me in it. So I can't put it on and hear something new. And that's gonna be the case for a lot of these that we talk about here today. Okay, moving on to number eight, Aerosmith, Get a Grip, 1993 album. Loved this thing when it came out. It was their 11th studio album. It's their best-selling album worldwide, which I think is, is crazy by comparison to the stuff they put out in the 70s. It has sold 20 million copies worldwide, but it is their second best-selling album in the U.S. with 7 million copies. Uh, Toys in the Attic has sold 9, rightly so, in my opinion. This one here featuring that trio of ballads, Crying, Amazing, and Crazy. You could not get away from these things in 1993-94 when those videos were out on MTV that featured um, 
uh, who were the two actresses that were in there. I know you guys know, uh, of course, one of them being his uh, daughter, Liv Tyler, was in there, Alicia Silverstone being the other one. And it, it made all of the videos tied. That was a pretty cool thing. But it also just overdid it, in my opinion. They were like little mini movies, so they got shown even more and more. Now, granted, it helped this album sell 7 million copies in the U.S. and is the largest selling album for them worldwide, so I get all of that. But the album itself also doesn't rock as hard, so while I did enjoy it very much at the time, it's not one that I return to all that often because it's got songs that are way too overplayed and popular. It doesn't quite rock as hard as other Aerosmith albums. I will tend to, if I'm going to go back to a, an 80s, 90s era Aerosmith, I'll return to Pump hands down over and over. Okay, coming in at number seven, I know, big shocker for everyone here, Nirvana Nevermind from 1991, their second studio album and first on major label debut, Geffen Records, or uh, DGC actually. Um, Credited as popularizing grunge, uh, the thing has sold over 10 million copies in the US and over 30 million copies worldwide. Just showing you how big this album actually is, despite it not being one of those classic rock standard kind of a things. Uh, features Smells Like Teen Spirit, which we know that thing was so overdone. Not only was it so overdone, it got parodied left and right. So you've got all of that stuff thrown in with it. Come As You Are, Lithium. And then if Smells Like Teen Spirit was enough, they basically have a duplicate of that song in bloom so um again loved that album changed my life when it came out showed me that rock didn't have to be this pristine thing that it had been in the 80s that you could be wearing jeans and t-shirts and stuff and playing very simple style things and yet it could be really amazing so again i love this album but it was so overplayed overdone it's one of those ones that everybody talked about um, and it just appeared everywhere and now it's one of those things that appears on the tops of everyone's list is greatest album of all time or greatest album of the 90s and of course since Kurt Cobain killed himself the album itself has grown in stature because all of that maybe to a level that I don't think it ever should have been uh, case in point we've got Pearl Jam and their stuff and they've continued on and while their stuff is super huge it has never climbed to the level of that to its intensity and that's just what happens when someone passes away or they take their life that sort of stuff so I think this album uh, has a lot of that and of course with what happened and him killing himself that also just left a bad taste in my mouth uh, regarding the whole thing but of course, as I'll always say throughout this, everybody needs to own these albums. <laughs> All right, now I was just mentioning the other big grunge rockers of the 90s. Number six is Pearl Jam and 10 from 1991 also. You could probably also credit this one as half popularizing grunge as well, but it was Nirvana and Smells Like Teen Spirit that broke the whole thing wide open. Uh, Pearl Jam sort of paved the way for that um, with their album and so forth. This was their debut album here, and of course it came as a follow-up to Mother Love Bone when, unfortunately, the lead singer of that band passed away. And so this band, Pearl Jam, was born out of the ashes of that, so tragedy there led to, of course, this. It has sold over 13 million copies alone in the U.S. and featured a trio of really big singles, Alive, Even Flo, and Jeremy. Uh, the debut single, Alive, and especially the third single, Jeremy, were so overplayed. I uh, just don't need to hear or see them, especially Jeremy. I think I would say if I had to put it at the top, it is that one, then Alive. I actually still really like the song, Even Flow, and can dig that. But um, I will go back to verses hands down over and over and over. Even though that was played a lot, it's nowhere near as overplayed as this one. But again, it's just one of those things that the album itself and its presence in popular culture, medium, uh, media, as well as with a lot of these albums, it's oversaturated. Uh, you, you know, if you're going to go to top 10 lists, these albums are on them across the board. And that's the kind of stuff that uh, ends up pulling me back from a lot of it. Not to mention just the fact that I know these things inside and out. All right, coming in at number five. 
The Eagles, Hotel California from 1976, their fifth studio album. First to feature guitarist Joe Walsh in the lineup, but it was the last to feature bassist Randy Meisner in the group. Uh, one of the best-selling albums of all time, it has sold 26 million copies in the U.S., 32 million albums worldwide. Uh, it had some big hits on it, like New Kid in Town and, of course, Life in the Fast Lane, but the monster hit is the title track, Hotel California. If you were going to have a top 10 countdown of songs, this song, as well as you know Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven, are going to be on that list no matter what, so you just hear them everywhere. And when I first heard Hotel California, it blew my mind. And it's just one of those ones, I still love the song, but I probably don't ever need to hear it as I know that thing inside and out. So even though maybe as a whole, like I could probably listen to, to Life in a Fast Lane again and again, because I do love that song. But when I go to pull this album out and I think, ah, Hotel California, I just don't need to hear that again. It goes back on the shelf and I end up reaching for another Eagles album. Um, and you just end up uh, you know, trying something else. I jump to the long run a lot. That is another one I really like. All right, coming in at number four, another one that's probably a shocker for a lot of you guys. Metallica's Black Album, 1991, self-titled release, uh, fifth studio album for them. It was a huge breakthrough, uh, opened up the world to metal, uh, really popularized it as a popular medium, I want to say. I mean, of course, metal had been around for a long time, uh, made it a chart-topping type thing. This album's uh, the biggest selling metal album out there, having sold 16 million copies in the U.S. alone. And the album itself has spent longer on the Billboard charts since sound scan started in 1991 than any other album with over 550 weeks uh, wait on that before you start commenting on Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon which I'll touch on later this one here features uh, Inner Sandman The Unforgiven Nothing Else Matters Wherever I May Roam Sad But True all great songs but just again overplayed now what i will say is that while inner sandman is one of those ones that is overplayed and stuff some of these tracks too are ones that uh, not a lot of you know but i do play guitar so back when i was a kid learning to play guitar popular album of the day you're learning lots of those songs inner sandman was one of those so not only was i playing it on guitar and i'm seeing it on mtv and every time the band performed on an award show they did it and just so forth and so on and it's just that oversaturation in the market of it their biggest album it's the one everyone's going to talk about and so forth but of course they've got far better albums out there and so forth all right here we go with one that is probably going to blow a lot of people's minds. Uh, it is another Black album. Number three, ACDC's Back in Black from 1980, the seventh uh, studio album from them. First to feature Brian Johnson taking over for Bon Scott, who unfortunately had passed away. Uh, this album itself meant as a tribute, part of the reason that uh, it's titled Back in Black, and they wrote that song and so forth. It is the best-selling rock album ever. Uh, worldwide, 25 million copies in the U.S., 50 million worldwide. The only album uh, that has even sold more than this is um, Michael Jackson's Thriller. This is the number two all-time selling album ever. Uh, features You Shook Me All Night Long, Hell's Bells, Back in Black. So if just the fact of how many copies this thing sells has sold doesn't tell you the, f the amount of saturation that is out there on this thing. Um, you know, it's just that thing again where every, you know, countdown list is gonna have these songs, every countdown list is gonna have this album on it. If you're gonna see the band live, these songs are gonna be performed and so forth. I love the song You Shook Me All Night Long, but probably never need to hear the songs Hell's Bells and Back in Black ever again. Although I will say that when I went and saw them on the last tour, which is a while back now at this point, the Rocker Bus Tour, when Axl Rose came in and took over for Brian Johnson and Axl Rose sang Back in Black, I really enjoyed it. But then there was something new to it that was different than what I had always heard over and over. So it made it 
interesting to hear the Back in Black era songs done because somebody else was singing them. Not that I want Brian Johnson to leave the band. Um, it's just the fact that if I'm going to reach for an album, it is probably not going to be this one. Uh, case in point again, I learned all these songs when I was a kid on guitar. So knowing them on guitar, seeing them on TV, hearing them on the radio, etc., etc. of course. Now, look at the shirt I'm wearing. You guys all know I'm a Pink Floyd fan. Coming in at number two, though, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, 1973, their eighth studio album. It was the first album I ever bought by Pink Floyd. I've got multiple versions of this thing. I've got uh, the standard edition. I've got a remastered edition. I've got a 20th anniversary edition. I have the immersion box set edition of this thing. It's getting ready to get a 50th anniversary edition of it. And if that wasn't enough, Roger Waters just re-recorded this album. So, you know, do I need another copy of this thing? No, but here, what I wanted to point out, because when I talked about the Metallica Black album being the album that has spent the most time on the chart since 1991, SoundScan started counting. Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon has the most number of weeks on the chart of any album ever, but that's prior to the way that they were counted. It's, it's a way that they were reported by labels, so very hard to confirm that, but generally, um, you know, people go along with this assessment of it, which is it has spent the longest time on the charts than any other album, 962 weeks, uh, Metallica being the second longest at 550 weeks. This thing has sold over 15 million copies in the US, 45 million copies worldwide. It's got tremendous amount of hits on this thing, money, time, us and them great gig in the sky and it's for that last song there great gig in the sky that i just i've never liked i don't need to hear again i'm tired of people praising it saying what an amazing thing it is unfortunately it is those gospel vocals on it that i just don't care for kind of a thing and so it's a combination of people's glowing reviews and presentation of of this thing that is the and with its overplayedness that sometimes just turns me off from it but you know as a young kid 13 14 putting this on for the first time and listening to it over and over and over and that sort of a thing going and seeing pink floyd on tour in 1994 hearing this album performed in its entirety which at the time i loved having pulse which is a live recording of the album in its entirety and as i just mentioned roger waters having re-recorded this thing it hasn't yet come out but we're going to get another version of this so i'm excited but i'm not excited all right and the number one popular album that i never need to hear again but i own multiple copies of led zeppelin 4 1971 fourth studio album uh, this thing was a commercial and critical success right out of the gate for the band. It has sold over 24 million copies in the U.S., 37 million copies worldwide, features some of the biggest rock songs ever, rock and roll, Black Dog, and the biggest song ever that is always number one on everybody's countdown list, Stairway to Heaven. So like Hotel California, this track is always at the top. I just don't even listen to these countdown things anymore for that reason. You know, case in point, there is a reason that guitar shops all have signs hanging up that say, no stairway to heaven. <laughs> all right, so there you go. Top 10 popular albums that I never need to hear again. Maybe you don't need to hear these albums ever again. What's your biggest, most popular album that you once loved and or maybe still love, but never need to hear again? Let me know in the comments. All right, everyone, take care, have a good one. Uh, as a related topic, uh, as a reversal in the idea of this, there was top 10 hated albums that I love. I'm gonna leave a link to that in the description. These two videos kind of go hand in hand with one another. And uh, certainly if you've enjoyed this, consider sharing it out on social media to help spread the word. I would greatly appreciate it. All right, everyone, take care, have a good one, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.